There were 600 players drafted in the NBA in the 2010s. And today I'll be bringing that number down to just 20. Combining all 10 drafts in the decade into one singular redraft, accounting for their careers so far, all the way through what we can expect out of them into the future. And with the first pick in this draft, the Sacramento Kings are gonna select Giannis Antetokounmpo. I didn't feel like there was really another option for the first overall pick here. Someone that has won multiple MVPs, someone that has already won a title and still has so much more to accomplish, is in the very middle of his prime, is the most dominant player we have in the league right now. And out of all the players that were drafted in the 2010s in a redraft, I want Giannis first. And to be honest, I feel like that first pick is really the only thing that isn't up for debate here. With the second pick, I'm gonna go with Nikola Jokic. And even though I do have to wait a little bit for him to become the kind of player that he ultimately becomes, I have to deal with a couple of seasons where they're still trying to figure out if he is the main five in Denver. Once he becomes who he is now, I get an MVP candidate, someone that everybody fits with. And even though the team's success hasn't happened for him yet, in terms of getting to the conference finals and the finals, I think it's gonna happen and he is still so young. With the third pick in the redraft, I think this one is gonna be slightly controversial. I'm gonna go with Kawhi Leonard. Here's my reasoning. He's won a title with multiple franchises and at his peak, when he's fully healthy, he has been considered the best player in the league at times. And as you go and look throughout the rest of this list, I'm not sure that's the case for anyone else. You do have to deal with at times health issues. Maybe you're concerned about his longevity into the future, but coming from the 2011 draft all the way through to now, he has a complete resume top to bottom I'm gonna go with him third. At number four now, we have our second selection from the 2014 draft, and it's Joel Embiid. I really considered putting him third in this redraft, but I didn't for two reasons. One, you have to wait a couple of years for him to really become who he is and get healthy. And two, in the long term, I do still have some longevity concerns with him in terms of him being a 70 plus game a year guy. He always seems to have these kinds of little injuries, even since he's gotten healthy after those first couple of seasons. Slight concerns there for me, but he's gonna be an MVP caliber player if healthy. He's still in his prime, still has a lot to accomplish. I'm comfortable putting him four. At number five now, going to the New York Knicks, which is really fun, I have Luka Doncic. I think there are gonna be a lot of you that are gonna argue he should have been higher. Here's the only reason Luca wasn't higher. Everybody else on this list ahead of him, we've seen who they are and what they are over a longer period of time. And Luca coming in in just the 2018 draft, the fact that he's as high on this list as he is, is incredibly impressive with as young as he is. And he does still have room to grow. He's been an MVP candidate this year and last year. But the other guys just have a little bit more on their resume and it's a little bit riskier to just continue to project that on down the road. I'm not just picking these guys from today forward. I'm also accounting for what they did prior to this redraft. And so ultimately that puts them at a very respectable number five. At number six now is my last player in kind of the tier one group here. And it's Anthony Davis. And even as frustrated as we can get with Anthony Davis at times with him not being able to stay on the floor, him maybe being disengaged on the floor at times. He is still a champion. He played fantastic in the finals with the Lakers. And when he is healthy and when he is locked in and engaged, he has the ability to be one of the best players in the entire league. And I'm not sure that's the case for anyone else on this list being a, a potential top three, top four player, or if it is gonna happen for them, we haven't seen it yet. So even though I did have a tendency to maybe rank AD a little bit lower than I should have, I'm gonna leave him at six in this top tier because if he's healthy, he's unbelievable. At number seven now, beginning the second tier is Damian Lillard. And here's the reason why. I know what it looks like with Damian Lillard as the face of a franchise. I know what it looks like with him as the number one guy. If you put a good team around him, you can win 50 games. Your organization is gonna be stable. You're not gonna to have to worry about him leaving all the time. And I think that counts for something, especially in an era in which it's never been more difficult to stay and be loyal to your team. Not to mention the incredible talent that he is on the basketball court. He's had an awesome career. He should age pretty well as well, given his ability to shoot the basketball. I'm really comfortable with him at seven. At number eight now is our first selection from the 2010 draft. Maybe a bit of a surprise to be this high. I have Paul George at eight in this redraft. I've seen Paul George put together a top three MVP level season in his career. A very good two-way player when he's locked in and engaged. You can talk about some of the issues in the playoffs if you want to, but when you combine what he's done to this point in his career in Indiana, in Oklahoma City, with the Clippers, and what he could still do moving forward as a relatively young player if he can stay healthy, I think eight's a really good spot for him. And number nine now is the last player in this second tier, and the guy that's at the top of the list to make this list 
look really dumb within the next couple of years, and it's Jason Tatum. I wanted to put him higher. I truly, truly did, but it's a little bit like the Luka thing. He comes into the 2017 draft. Luka's in the 2018 draft, and as much as I'm seeing Jason Tatum become a top player in the NBA, and as much as I'd like to continue to project that out and say this is what it's going to look like five years from now, it's more difficult to put him up at the top when I haven't actually seen that longevity yet in comparison to someone like Anthony Davis, who I've seen it over a couple of years span, or Kawhi Leonard, who I've seen it over half a decade span. Jason Tatum is incredible. He's unbelievable. He's still so young. He's going to accomplish so much. But you have to deduct points a little bit, I think, when you're just talking about projection and youth rather than what you've actually seen on the court. No disrespect to him, but I have him at nine. And number 10 now, maybe a little bit of a surprise, I'm going to put Devin Booker right here. Devin Booker is a player that I know is going to be able to fit with pretty much anybody I put on the floor. He's going to be able to shoot. He can play on the ball. He can play off the ball. He's going to compete defensively. He's been to a finals and the reputation of him has changed dramatically over the last couple of seasons. A couple years ago, Devin Booker might threaten to not even make this list with how much talent there's been drafted into the league in the 2010s, but I'm going to put him at number 10. And number 11 now is another player that I wish I could put higher and it's John ja Morant. He's an incredible leader. He's still so young. He was only drafted in 2019. The fact that he's as high on this list as he is, is kind of unbelievable. But again, I want to continue to see him grow moving forward. I want to continue to see what he's going to add to his game. And I'm projecting for him to be an MVP caliber player for the next four to five seasons. And he is still not even in his prime yet, but I haven't seen it yet over a long period of time. And so again, I'm cool with him at this spot. No disrespect. It's a great place for him to be this early in his career. And number 12 is a player I struggled to rank, and it's Trey Young. He is an incredible offensive player. But on the other end of the floor, he's arguably the worst player in the entire league. And so if he was able to shore that up, maybe he's not capable. Maybe he's not physically capable of being an average NBA defender. I'm not sure. But I have a hard time putting him ahead of all the other incredible players that were drafted in the 2010s to this point if he's just a complete zero on the other end of the floor. Not that some of these guys are fantastic defenders, but when you're literally the worst defender in the league, potentially, and by some advanced numbers, I do have to punish you a little bit, but he's an incredible player, and 12 is a good spot for him. At number 13, good luck ranking this guy. It's Kyrie Irving. He's an NBA champion. He's hit one of the most iconic shots in NBA Finals history. And he's also bounced around to a couple of different teams. And he's also made some teammates unhappy in some past spots. And he's also been incredibly inconsistent in terms of when he's been able to be on the floor. But when he is there, when he is playing, he's one of the most skilled basketball players that we've ever seen. He's an incredible scorer. He's someone that makes the game look so, so easy. And ultimately, I landed with 13, but I'm sure there are some of you that are going to have him even outside of your top 20, and that's fine. Good luck trying to rank this guy in a redraft. At number 14 is Jimmy Butler. From this point on, it's really a struggle for me to feel rock solid about a ranking, but I feel pretty good about Jimmy Butler at 14. He's made a finals. We've seen him be the best player on a finals team. He's a really good two-way player when he's locked in and he's engaged. The fit around him can be a little bit questionable because he does not space the floor. That's something that has completely fallen away from his game over the last couple of seasons. And as a result, he's a little further down, but there's there's no shame in that, in being right here, considering where he was drafted in 2011. At 15 now is another player from 2011, and it's Klay Thompson. And the question mark for me is longevity. Are we ever going to see old Klay Thompson again on a consistent level? At his peak, in his prime, he was a fantastic second at times, third option, one of the best shooters that the league has ever seen. And if he never got hurt and continued to be the level player that he was then throughout the rest of his career, he would have been much, much higher on this list. But I think there are some question marks now in terms of his longevity. So I do bring him down a few spots for that. But 15, I think is a pretty solid spot. At number 16 from the 2012 draft is Bradley Beal. And he's been loyal to Washington despite some drama. He's an incredible scorer. He's a little bit undersized as a two. And I'm not sure that you're incredibly happy if he is your number one player in terms of team success, but he's had an awesome career and still is pretty young, still should continue to grow and develop as well, maybe find himself in a better situation and we'll think differently of him over the next couple of years, but I have him here. At 17 is Carl Anthony Towns. I I, I did not know what to do with him. I really wanted to put him higher, but the more that I looked at the list, I was like, it's just such a stacked group to try and rank. The point you would make to put Carl Anthony Towns higher on this list would be he is a top five player at his position. The other positions are so stacked that to have a player 
as good as Carl Anthony Towns is relative to the other players at his position would certainly be a positive for him. I struggled with this ranking, but I'm going to put him here. At number 18 is going to be Zach Levine. I know there are going to be some Bulls fans that are going to be mad and upset, but again, it comes down a little bit to how cluttered that backcourt stuff is in this redraft. There's so many great guards. There's so many great backcourt players. And I, it's just kind of a long list before I get to Zach Levine, but he's been unbelievable. He's continued to grow and develop. Again, no disrespect to him by putting him here. At 19 is the guy that I need help ranking more than anyone else, more than Kyrie, more than Jimmy Butler, more than Carl Anthony Towns. Where do I put Draymond Green in a redraft? You can make the argument he should have been top 10 because of everything that he's meant to that Warriors team. When you just look at his accolades as a champion as a defensive player of the year, as a guy that's making multiple all defense teams. Ultimately, I just kind of feel like his career is over. And in terms of years in the league, it's going to end up being much, much shorter at a peak level than a lot of the other players ahead of him. But if you just want to argue how great that peak was and how much he meant to his team, I'd be cool ranking him higher than this. And the last pick in our top 20 in the redraft is Rudy Gobert from the 2013 draft. He is a defensive player of the year caliber player every single year. He is someone that, yeah, has struggles offensively at times in terms of creating his own offense. And when it's not a dunk at the rim or a lob, you really can't use him that much. And defensively, there are times when he can be a liability but you can't deny how great of a defensive player he has been over the last couple of years. I'm going to put him here at 20. And that is my 2010 redraft. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, leave a like rating on it. My name is Sucker, and I'll see y'all next time.